The word camouflage means to hide or disguise the presence of a person, animal, or object. It's a tactic used mostly by military personnel to remain undetected by the enemy, but it could also be used for truly evil purposes by people you'd least expect. Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James and today we'll be diving into the life and times of a man many trusted and held up as a standard in society, Russell Williams. How could a man, the commander of one of the biggest Air Force bases in Canada and a highly decorated colonel with a career many describe simply as a shining bright star, become a cold-hearted killer, hiding in plain sight? Russell Williams was born on March 7, 1963, in Broomsgrove, England. Coming from a small family, his parents were David and Christine Williams, with Russell's little brother Harvey being born two years later. When Russell was five years old, the family became Canadian immigrants, moving to Chalk River, Ontario in 1968. Moving can be tough, especially when it's a new country, but the Williams didn't have to go through all that alone. They met the Solvkas, Jerry and Lynn, another married couple, and the two families became very close. A year later though, their happy tidings would come to an abrupt end. Russell's parents would file for divorce after David Williams was found cheating on Christine with Jerry Solvkas' wife, Lynn. However, Christine would then get remarried to Lynn's husband, Jerry. She changed her name to Noni Sobkes and moved with Russell and Harvey to a quiet neighborhood in Scarborough, Ontario. Russell was seven at the time and became known as Russell Sovka. You might think that this may have been a moment of darkness for him, but by all accounts, Russell had a good childhood despite his parents' divorce. In fact, reports describe Russell as polite, well-behaved, and a shy child who then on went to become a young man that was self-disciplined, reliable, and very meticulous in his activities. As a teenager, Russ attended high school at Birchmount Collegiate Toronto. He ran a newspaper route, delivering mail and globe papers. Russell also trained in piano and trumpet. In 1979, his stepfather Jerry moved the family to South Korea where he had been employed to oversee a nuclear reactor project. Russ would move to Toronto in 1980 with his brother Harvey, completing the final two years of high school at Upper Canada College. While he was there, Russ was an exemplary student, excelling in drama, music, and sports, and was elected as a prefect. These are the times that foreshadowed the bright future for Russell. One where he would soon serve the country as Colonel of the Canadian Armed Forces. He went on to study economics and politics at the University of Toronto Scarborough. He even changed his last name back to his father's for an unexplained reason, once again becoming Russell Williams. He learned how to fly at a municipal airport while studying full-time whilst living in a basement apartment, alongside waiting tables at Red Lobster. Russell would enroll in the Canadian Forces in 1987, and by 1990, he had received his flying wings and moved to Manitoba, where he served as a flight instructor. The next year was big for Russell. He was promoted to captain and tied the knot with Mary Elizabeth Harriman, an applied science graduate from the University of Guelph. It was an intimate ceremony held in Winnipeg. Over the next decade, Williams' military career saw various changes in postings and promotions. In 1994, he would handle the transport of many important people, like dignitaries and government officials from other countries. In command of their flight, an officer on his way up in the Canadian Forces, Lieutenant Colonel Russell Williams. Over the next decade, 
He would obtain a Master of Defense Studies in 2004 from the Royal Military College with a thesis arguing on the issue of preemptive strikes in the Iraq War. By June of 2004, Russ was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. His career would reach new heights in December of 2005 when he served as the commanding officer of a covert logistics facility in Dubai called Camp Mirage until May 2006. His return to Canada wasn't uneventful. With Williams battling chronic pain, he received various prescriptions, including prednisone, prescriptions that many who knew Williams said that they were the cause of his insomnia. Simultaneously, the Williams sold their home in Orleans, replacing it with a townhouse in Westboro Village, Ontario. Mary Elizabeth was now an Associate Executive Director of the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada. While they made sure to spend their weekends together, to golf and garden, Russell was yet again mostly alone, despite being a successful married man. Russell's handling of abandonment or loss had been described as intense by his friends and family, as seen when the couple's cat, 18-year-old Curio, had to be euthanized. It was a particularly painful event for Russell, putting him under distress. Even Russell mentioned the loss a couple of times during interrogations for his crimes. During his time in Quebec, during 2009, he received another promotion, this time making him Colonel. Now, Colonel Williams, as he was sworn in as Wing Commander for the Canadian Forces Base Trenton in July 2009. While Russell was transcending his competition career-wise, things would soon take a dark turn. Before 2007, Russell Williams was a decorated member of the Canadian military with no criminal records whatsoever. However, as they say, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. And so, in 2007, Russell began breaking into homes near him and his wife's home at Ottawa in 2008. According to reports and evidence, he would scope out his neighbors' homes, making sure that no one was there, before entering to steal any female underwear he could find. He would also take personal items. On one occasion, he broke into a 12-year-old girl's home, spending almost three hours as he took pictures of himself in her underwear and clothing or while he pleasured himself on her bed. Yeah, I bet you weren't expecting this when I mentioned he'd go on to commit crimes, huh? On another occasion, pictures he took showed him lying on a 15-year-old girl's bed while he pleasured himself as he held up a stuffed bear. Upon his arrest, other pictures were found, showing pictures of him kissing or licking underwear he had stolen. Some of them were stained with blood. There wasn't a search for a prowler in the neighborhood, though, because no one usually noticed their houses had been broken into. Williams even burglarized some of the houses on more than one occasion. Much of the evidence used to convict him in court was from his own stash of pictures, as though he were a scrapbooker taking mementos of his hobby. It also showed the progression of his crimes, from breaking in to dressing himself up in female underwear as part of his odd fetish, or frolicking nude in the bedrooms of young girls' rooms. He began to leave notes behind. On one occasion, he left a note saying, Malsi on a girl's computer. Then he moved on to leaving behind items that he used to please himself sexually. But this wasn't enough for Williams. He was just getting started. In July of 2009, he took off his clothes and pleasured himself as he watched an unsuspecting woman take a shower. Then, while she was in the bathroom, he entered her room through the window and stole her underwear. Williams would carry out about 62 successful B&Es 
before physically abusing women in September 2009. Russell Williams' first victim was a woman known to the public as Jane Doe. She was a testimony witness at Williams' trial. On September 17, 2009, she had fallen asleep with her infant at home in Tweed when a man identified as Williams broke into her house, binding, blindfolding, and fondling her. He undressed her, took pictures of her naked body, and was in her home for two hours before he left, promising that she and her baby would not be harmed. A few hours after this incident, Russell Williams was a member of the planning committee meeting for an upcoming charity event for the Criminal Intelligence Service of Ontario. It was as though he was two different people in one body. He would go on to assault Lori Massacott in her home just two weeks later. It was not the first time he had been in Lori's home, having been there many times before to steal some of her lingerie. Like the first victim, Lori had been asleep on the night of September 30th, 2009, and woke up to someone punching her in the head. Williams proceeded to blindfold and restrain Lori, forcing her to pose in pornographic manners as he took pictures of her. His intent seemed to be more focused on picture taking than it was on physically abusing her. At some point, Williams seemed to show some sort of remorse, apologizing to Lori for the punch to the head and allowed her to take some aspirin. Drops of water look little until they make up a puddle. Williams's drops of break-ins, trespassing, theft, and sexual assault piled up until they culminated in cold-blooded murder. On November 25th, 2009, Williams took his twisted antics up a notch when he stalked and killed Marie-France Commune. She was 37 and was a military flight attendant based at the same base where Williams was a wing commander. Marie France had discovered Williams hiding in her basement at home. Startled, Williams attacked Camus, striking her repeatedly with a flashlight. Williams rendered her unconscious, wrapped her in duct tape, and for two hours, he went on to essay, torture, and torment Camus repeatedly. He also recorded Camus' ordeal on a video camera. All of her pleas and cries for help fell on deaf ears. After Williams was done satiating his evil, he placed duct tape over Camus' nose and watched her die slowly. He then cleaned up the scene of his evil deed and went back to the base as though nothing had happened. It seemed as though Williams' break-in and general criminal activity stopped after he brutally murdered Camus. His cooling period was short, however, and the following year, he would strike again. Jessica Lloyd was a 27-year-old living in Belleville, a community not too far from Tweed. On January 28, 2010, Jessica sent a text to a family friend before she presumably turned in for the night around 10.36 p.m. It was the last she was heard of, as she never turned up for work the next morning. Her family, anxious, reported her missing to the police, stating it was out of character for Jessica to not contact anyone about her whereabouts. Unknown to them, Williams had broken into Jessica's home that night, blindfolding her with duct tape and binding her with ropes. He took sexual advantage over Jessica for three hours and then took her to his cottage, continuing the torture for another 21 hours. He had promised Jessica he would not kill her, but he hit her with his flashlight and then he strangled her. Like he did with Marie, Williams documented Jessica's torture and death on photo and video. Leaving her body in the garage, he went back to work at the base. He returned to retrieve and dump the body elsewhere three days later. 
At the same time, the Belleville police and the general public were dedicating countless hours and efforts to locate Jessica. At Jessica's home, investigators had identified some unusual tire tracks that Williams had left behind in the snow. With this information, the Ontario Provincial Police searched all cars using the highway close to Jessica's home, looking for a match to the tracks they had found. Williams was one of the motorists in the search, and an officer noted that there was a match with his tire treads. Police placed Williams on immediate police surveillance. His tire treads were eventually matched to the evidence found outside Jessica's home. And when he was asked to report at the Ottawa Police Service headquarters for questioning on February 7th, 2010, the interrogation lasted for 10 hours. And after he had been presented with all the incriminating evidence, he finally made a confession. He didn't just confess to Jessica's murder, he confessed to all of his many crimes. Williams gave detailed accounts of his crimes, including all of the tweed fetish break-ins and sexual abuse. He also showed police where his stash of evil was. Memorabilia from all of his crimes were carefully catalogued and hidden inside his Ottawa home and the Tweed Cottage. Finally, he pointed out the location where he had dumped Jessica's body on a map. On February 13, 2010, the Lloyd family held a funeral service for their daughter in Belleville. When Williams was asked why he had committed these crimes, he simply said, I don't know the answers, and I'm pretty sure the answers don't matter. Before his hearing, Williams tried to commit suicide and took on a hunger strike. Both attempts were unsuccessful, and he was placed under 24-hour suicide watch and solitary confinement. A grand total of 82 criminal code charges were filed against Russell Williams. He made his first appearance in court on October 7, 2010. On October 18, 2010, Russell Williams pleaded guilty to all the charges. On the first day and over the course of his trial, accounts of other crimes emerged. These include a mother who was attacked while she and her newborn were asleep in the house. It was also revealed that Williams possessed pedophilic tendencies based on the number of underwear he had stolen belonging to girls as young as nine. Williams' total number of home invasions and break-ins between September 2007 and November 2009 was rounded up at 82. The prosecution revealed that Williams even kept tabs on police reports of his crimes. He had a system for his crimes logging and documenting details about how they went down, like a shopkeeper doing inventory. Some of the evidence, such as photos of Williams wearing the underwear he had stolen, was released to the press and published in papers. On October 19, 2010, Williams was found guilty of all charges filed against him. Three days later, he was sentenced to two concurrent life terms. Some accounts hold that Williams seemed to show remorse for his actions. He wrote letters by hand to the parents of Jessica Lloyd and Marie France Camus, as well as his wife regretting the shame he had put her through and asking her to take care of their cat Rosie. Marie Elizabeth filed for divorce from him in 2010 and their marriage was annulled in 2014. Initially imprisoned at Kingston Penitentiary, Russell Williams is now incarcerated at Port Carrier Institution in Quebec after Kingston was closed down. In an exorcism of sorts, Williams' uniform was burnt by the Canadian forces. All of his medals and awards were revoked. Although Williams was not technically a serial killer, committing just two murders, he is regarded as one, as he would have surely killed again if he hadn't been caught. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Russell Williams, and why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.